Okay, so at the end, you should end up with a handout and a Rice Krispie treat. Y'all need a handout. Y'all are walking in a handout and a Rice Krispie treat. <laughs> a handout and a Rice Krispie treat. I'm sorry for those of you who are on Zoom. I have Rice Krispie treats for everybody who is here. And I'll tell y'all why in a second. Okay, please go in, y'all. Please go in right now and do the seating chart. Please right now go in and do the seating chart. If you're on Zoom, you can put your name down here. So even if you're just on Zoom and you get a rice cookie juice. <laughs> and if there are Rice Krispie treats left at the end, please take them on your way out. <laughs> Because I do not need them. I do not need them. Yes. What do you mean for both of them? So do both the eye clicker and the. Excel, it's not Excel sheets. Yes, I know, it's so confusing. Okay, you need a handout and you need a Rice Krispie Treats. Well, you don't need one, but you can have one. <laughs> need is, you know, a relative chart. You need a handout and we have Rice Krispie Treats. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. Y'all about ready? No. No, never. Yes, ma'am. Oh, because I didn't log in. I pulled it up and I didn't log in. It's my fault. My fault. I did. That was my fault. Okay, now you should be able to do both eye clicker and you should be able to do the sheets. All right, so you should be able to do eye clicker. Yay. Okay, 
So I'm gonna start today. I feel like I owe y'all a couple of jokes. Yeah, feeling it? All right, so what did one eye say to the other eye? Just between you and me, something smells. That's a good one, right? That's a good one. <laughs> All right, let's see. What do you get when you cross a parrot and a centipede? A walkie talkie. Okay, and last one, last one. Um, why did the teacher wear sunglasses? Because her students were so bright. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that was a great one, right? That was a great one. So um, today, today is a special um, Rice Krispie Treat Day because I subjected you to recorded videos, and in the middle of the recording, now, now I tell my son, if you're coming in late, you need a handout, handout, and a Rice Krispie Treat. Oh. Uh, so I, I told my son, I said, do not interrupt me unless it is in emergency. And he says to me, he says, so like if I'm bleeding, I was like, yeah, that would qualify. <laughs> so then in the middle of Zoom, here comes Charles. Can I have ice cream? <laughs> hey, that's an emergency. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> So I, I couldn't bring ice cream, it's just not feasible. So I thought I would bring you Rice Krispies. Thought that would be nice. Welcome back, right? It's so nice to see everybody. It's so nice for everybody to be back in the same classroom. And um, so today was supposed to be our exam, right? But instead of that, I thought we would have a really fun day because this is one of my favorite things ever. Um, chapter three is all about um, DNA techniques. And I just love all that kind of stuff. And so anybody know what the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was won for? CRISPR, CRISPR, CRISPR. So today I saved that. Did you notice I didn't cover CRISPR in my recorded lecture? So I saved CRISPR for us in person. Oh, yes. And Rice Krispie Treats for CRISPR, right? So I figured it was a perfect combination. And, um, and we're, gonna, we're gonna do a little activity with some plasmids and stuff. So that's my plan for today. Make sure that you are on, you've put your name on the sheets here and you have checked in. There's still 18 absent on iClicker. So make sure you have done that. Yes, ma'am. Can you see if mine says present because it won't is present air. Okay, cool. present and you can always check at the end of class if, if you're not sure if it's if it's like not working yet is that what the problem is oh right here you did not get a handout anybody else not get a handout need one if you are on zoom the handouts are on moodle and i'll show you in just a second okay all right so let's get rolling let's get rolling Oh, and I got something on the chat. I'm sorry. Okay, Tammy, I'm going to try to monitor that chat. So much, so, so much. Yeah, you make it too small and then it blows up on you. Okay, so if you, if you pull up the original notes that, that I gave you at the very beginning of the semester, you remember those? that had like the basically white background instead of the yellow. So at the very end, the only difference between the two is the very end where we have right here. Yeah, this one. So this is at the very end of what you already have on Moodle, right, of the slides. So let me do view full screen. <clears throat> All right. So the 2012 Nobel Prize um, was awarded to these two ladies right here, uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. So these two ladies um, are the scientists who figured out how to use CRISPR technology as a gene targeting tool. 
Okay, so that's with a, a DNA targeting, gene targeting, however you want to say that, but a targeting tool. So CRISPR was actually discovered in 2012 by other groups, right? So y'all remember, maybe I, maybe I have not talked about this yet, but do y'all remember when I said um, things like, eventually we're gonna get an antibiotic resistant bacteria? Have I said that in this class before? Not yet? I have, okay, I have. So, how do we fight bacteria in general? We use antibiotics, right? Did we invent antibiotics? No. It's a system that nature had in place in terms of fungi to defend against bacteria, right? So we didn't invent them, but we hijacked it to make it work for us. So that's exactly what these two ladies got the Nobel Prize for is hijacking this system and using it to our benefit, which is unbelievably amazing. So we're gonna first talk about exactly how the system works, and then we're gonna talk about what really the Nobel Prize was for and how we can use it to actually treat patients, because that's the name of the game, right? To save lives. So, um, and, and if you didn't know, October 20th is World CRISPR Day. So I don't know, maybe we'll have to do something special on the 20th. I don't know if I'm gonna see y'all on the 20th. I don't even know what day of the week that is. All right, so CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspersed Short Palindromic Sequences. All right, what does that mean? Well, I'm gonna kinda, I'm gonna kinda draw it out for you. So this is a defense mechanism. How do bacteria defend against, whoa, bacteria defend against a virus? What do they do, right? This is my little retrovirus that's hooked on and it's got DNA on the inside and it's gonna inject its DNA into my bacteria. And here's my bacterial chromosome. Okay, so typically bacteria methylate their DNA, right? Now, viruses do not. So when a virus injects its DNA into a bacteria, if it is unmethylated, the defense mechanism, right? Number one, that's supposed to be a one, this thing is, is to use a restriction enzyme to cut unmethylated DNA. Right? It's going to cut unmethylated DNA. That's the whole point of restriction enzymes. And we talked about them, right? They are relatively sequence specific, right? There are certain sequences that have to be present for a restriction enzyme to work. But they're very common sequences and they're kind of found everywhere. So you actually find sites that restriction enzymes cut inside of bacterial DNA. So why do restriction enzymes only cut viral DNA? These cut viral DNA. Why do they cut viral DNA and not bacterial DNA? Because bacterial is methylated, viral is not. So it cuts unmethylated DNA. Well, it's only going to cut viral DNA. So that's a great general mechanism general defense, right? Basically any unmethylated DNA is gonna get chopped up and eaten and degraded. Can the virus now replicate and make more viral particles? And No, we, we cut it down, right? Okay, there's another system that bacteria have, and this is the discoveries for this started in like 1990 and went all the way to about 2012. So the second me mechanism is specific. Very, very specific. And it's the CRISPR, E-R, there's no E, CRISPR, Cas9. Okay, so this viral particle infects our host bacteria. Here's our bacteria right? And this is our bacterial 
genome, right? It's one big circular chromosome. That's how I know it's bacteria. When the bacteria defeat the virus, there are going to be pieces of this viral genome floating around inside the bacterial cell. And so what the bacteria do is they actually go in and cut up that viral DNA and insert it into their own genome. So now I have this bacterial genome that has a piece of viral DNA inside of it. I don't know if you can tell the color difference, right? But that's the piece of viral DNA. So this is viral DNA inside of the bacterial chromosome. Why would you ever want to do that? So it's not about it's not about time. So what happens is every single viral particle that infects bacteria, the bacteria create an immunity, a, a memory of this virus by inserting a little piece of DNA into the genome. And they insert it into a particular place. And that's the CRISPR location. So this bacterial genome, right, has these repetitive elements. And in between these repetitive elements, so these are, these black things are the repetitive elements. So these are repetitive, U-P-E-T-A-T-I-V, repetitive elements. They have these spacers. So this spacer, guess what, comes from this virus. But is that the only virus that is ever gonna attack this bacteria? No. So a previous virus, that infected the bacteria, this is a little portion of its DNA that the bacteria saved. And this goes on and on and on. And I wish I knew how to do like all kinds of different really cool colors. All right, we've got some colors, right? So we could do green, we could do purple, right? And each one of those different colored fragments of DNA correspond to a different virus, right? So this is, I'll just do it this way. This is this virus. The green virus, it's the purple virus, right? The red virus. So each piece of DNA comes from a different viral particle. So if this bacteria sees any of these four viruses again, what it's actually going to do is to send out a defense mechanism to go and kill the virus and degrade the viral DNA. So how does it work? Well, it works like this. Let's say it's being infected again by this blue virus. What it actually ends up doing is creating an mRNA. It actually creates an mRNA of this whole thing. So it would look like this. It would look red, right, black, and then green, and so on and so on. But then it would eventually be processed so that you would have only the pieces that you want, like this, okay? So each little piece of mRNA, we have a sequence specific to the virus, and then we have this repetitive element. So what this repetitive element does is it associates with another mRNA from, and it's got some like loops in it and things like that, from the bacteria. So this is another bacterial mRNA. Now, what's cool about this other bacterial mRNA is that it matches this repetitive sequence here, right? So now I have part of it that's unique. This is the viral part that's unique. And then this is common between the two right here. This uncommon part actually targets the complex to Cas9. So this is my CRISPR part. Let's see if I could do this. This is my CRISPR mRNA. It's supposed to be mRNA. And then our second one targets it. So now I'm gonna recruit Cas9, which what is Cas9? Everybody read this? Cas9 is a protein that does what? Induces what? 
not apoptosis, double stranded breaks in DNA. So if I recruit this Cas9 system to this entire DNA complex, and if you look up here, I'm gonna scroll up here for a second, right? Here's our CRISPR RNA, right? This is the blue piece of RNA. This purple part is the part that's adjacent to this other bacterial RNA that recruits Cas9. It's called the tracer RNA. So let's go down and add that to our thing. What does it say? Tracer RNA. So this is the tracer RNA. Okay. Now label that one. Okay. So the tracer RNA, this is the one that recruits the protein Cas9. So do you see this blue blob? That's the protein. This is the protein that will actually cut DNA. Now, do you wanna cut any old DNA? No, we want it to be super, super specific, right? What do we want it to be specific to? The virus, the viral DNA, right? So this part of the CRISPR RNA sequence is specific to our target DNA. And our target DNA is the viral genome, the viral DNA, right? So it is going to specifically base pair with the viral genome. When that viral genome base pairs, Cas9 says, all oh, my pieces fit. Now I start cutting. And it introduces two cuts in both the target strand and the non-target strand. Tell me about double-stranded breaks in DNA. Can an organism survive with double-stranded breaks in their DNA? No, they can't. They can't. And the virus has no way to repair that. So we get double-stranded breaks. The result is, right, double-stranded DS DNA breaks in viral genome. A virus can't survive anymore. That's great, right? We have defeated the virus. So in prokaryotic organisms, they don't have a way to repair that. They just kind of die, that's it. We, on the other hand, have repair mechanisms for double-stranded breaks. And we're gonna talk about what those are today because we can use that, okay? So what we just described here is adaptive immunity in bacteria. Y'all, that is an insane statement. Adaptive immunity is supposed to be for like super advanced organisms like us, right? But we find it in bacteria. That's amazing. So that discovery in and of itself is really, really cool. Um, but now the question is, we have this interesting technology. Why is this amazing? The reason that this is amazing is because that target sequence right here, the blue one, we can manufacture it and make that sequence any sequence we want. Why is that cool? Now what can we target? Anything, we can target any gene in the human genome. You have a single base pair mutation that leads to sickle cell anemia. Let me fix it for you with CRISPR. We can do that. We've actually done that. Someone has had it done to them and it, the repair worked. Okay, this is unbelievably amazing technology. So when you, when you have this CRISPR system, and you put it into a eukaryotic system. So here, this is gonna be, this is use in a eukaryotic
we can target any gene, any gene we want it to, we can send this CRISPR-Cas9 complex to that gene, right? The gene that controls sickle cell anemia, whatever it is. And two things can happen. I can delete the gene or I can fix the gene. So have y'all heard of knockouts before in genetics or, yeah? Okay, so I can create a knockout, which means that the gene no longer exists. And I can kind of figure out, okay, what was that gene's function? How, what's going wrong now that it's not there, right? Then I can learn something about how this eukaryotic system works, right? I could do it maybe in mice, and then we would know what happens in humans and that kind of thing. Or the opposite is to do a gene knock-in. I'm going to start and tell you about the gene knock-in, then I'm going to tell you about the gene knockout. <coughs> so if you look here, right, do you see this green and pink? That corresponds to the green and pink. The end result of using the CRISPR-Cas9 is this double-stranded right here. This is our double-stranded break. This is a major alarm system in the eukaryotic system. A eukaryotic cell is like, hold your horses. We can't do anything until we fix this double-stranded break. There are two ways that you can fix a double-stranded break. One way is if you have a piece of DNA close by that matches the cut sites, the flanking cut sites, it can use that donor DNA as a template and it can fix it. So if I want to fix somebody who has sickle cell anemia, I'm going to give them this CRISPR-Cas9 system and I'm going to give them a piece of donor DNA that is correct. Now this piece of donor DNA won't incorporate into their DNA. It won't do it. It's not the way that the cell works. It'll just hang out. But if I have CRISPR-Cas9 and I introduce a double-stranded cut at the place where the mutation occurs, and now I have this correct donor piece of the DNA, that's the template that's gonna go in and fix the double-stranded break. What did I just do? I just fixed in the cell, the mutation. I just cured someone of this disease. This is, this is not a treatment. This is a cure. You are changing the person's DNA. It's not like giving them a medication and saying, you know, refill this once a month and this is going to help you feel better. No, this is actually fixing their DNA. Isn't that amazing? I felt like, I don't know, you're a little too excited about this. <laughs> but like, I am, I, this is the future of medicine. This is absolutely one of the, one of the big things that's going to turn things around for us. Um, the other thing that we can do in the lab, right, we don't necessarily want to usually knock out a gene in in a, in a living human. I mean, maybe there's, if it's duplicated and it's producing a mutated protein, and so you wanna get rid of the duplicated gene, but not the original gene, you could use this. Um, but typically this is more of a research application, right? I have a mouse, I wanna knock out this gene in a mouse and I wanna see what happens to the mouse so that I can figure out what's the function of this protein, right? So in a gene knockout, you introduce this double-stranded break but you don't give a homologous sequence for the cell to use as a template. So you don't give it that piece. Therefore, it doesn't have anything to go to, to say what's supposed to go right here. So what happens is you have what's called non-homologous in joining. So it just kind of sticks the pieces together. Even though you've lost a big chunk of DNA, it just kind of, crams it all back together. Do you think that's gonna end up with a functional protein? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. That function, that, that protein has lost its sequence, it's lost its structure, it's lost its function. It ain't going. <laughs> it is not gonna be performing its function. So now you have introduced a knockout, right? So the only difference in the two is how the cell repairs it. If you give it the template, you're gonna do homology-directed repair. If you don't give it the template, you'll have non-homologous end joining. Okay, that's the two differences. And if you have non-homologous end joining, that's a gene knockout. If you have homology-directed repair, that's a knock-in. 
because you're giving it a new sequence. You're saying this is the correct sequence to use. Isn't that like amazing? Okay, now I'm gonna tell you a couple of other applications of this, but first I wanna talk a little bit about ethics for like just a minute. Can you think of a major ethical dilemma that could come from this? So changing visual appearances, right? When we say we can use this to change your DNA, what I'm thinking is I can cure someone of sickle cell anemia. I can cure them of um, uh, Huntington's disease. I you know like all of these horrible diseases that we can fix, right? But the issue turns into then what's a disease and what's a preference, right? What's necessary and what is, I'd like some plastic surgery type, right? Okay, so, so if I say sickle cell anemia, disease or not? Definitely disease. Um, what about um, uh, Down syndrome? Not so easy, is it? And I'm not saying that you have to have an answer. And I'm, and I'm not telling you which answer to pick in any way, shape or form. But what I'm telling you is that it starts to get really murky, right? Okay, so the, the thing that you have to think about is there are really two types of cells that you can do this to. There are somatic cells and there are germline cells. Somatic cells are all the cells of the body. Germline cells are only sperm and egg, right? Only ones that lead to um, future generations of the organism. So if you change somatic cells, have you changed human evolution? No, no. But do we tell people that you can't go get, I don't know, Botox injections and, and collagen injections in your lips and whatever the cosmetic thing is that you want, do we tell people no? No, if you have the money, go do it, right? Okay, so if it's, if you're only changing somatic cells, <clears throat> I don't see an issue, right? Now, whether it's covered under your insurance or not then becomes an issue, right? Are you treating a disease? Are you doing a preference? Is this necessary surgery or is this cosmetic surgery, right? Same sort of deal. So now, when you start changing germline cells, what are you doing? You are changing evolution. You are absolutely changing evolution. Um, so you have to be extremely careful because as amazing as this is, and this is a hundred to a thousand times more effective than any form of gene editing that we have done in the past, a hundred to a thousand times more effective. <clears throat> it still can have off target effects that we don't know about. So you targeted one specific place in the <clears throat> genome. Does that mean that no other change in the entire genome was made? Not necessarily. They are low. They don't happen very frequently, but they happen. And so you have to think about that off target effects. And then, so in China, someone um, actually changed the genome of an embryo <coughs> to, and I don't remember if it was to delete a gene or to introduce a gene. I don't remember which it was, but it was using CRISPR Cas9 um, to make them resistant to the HIV virus. Now, you just, I, I believe it was an introduction. I think that's what it was. I have to go back and read up. I forgot over <clears throat> time. But um, if you did that, how do you know what the long-term effects of that are? And now you've just said that this child is going to pass this on to their offspring, right? Because he didn't do a somatic change. He tried, did a germline change on the embryo. So there are lots and lots and lots of ethics <clears throat> that we as scientists need to consider. And you guys are going to be the scientists. You are going to be the doctors who implement this. You are going to be a massive part of this. And so you should understand it 
and you should make your ethical um, concerns aware. You, you should make that, I don't know, I'm looking for the right word and I'm losing it, but you need to voice your concerns. You need to be the one to say, this isn't, we need some regulations on this. This is amazing. This is wonderful. This is great, but we need to regulate it, right? So it's utterly amazing. I keep doing this. It's utterly amazing, um, but we also need to think about the implications of it, right? So totally cool. Okay, so I told you I was going to tell you a couple of the other um, uses of the Casper Chris nine Casper CRISPR Cas nine uh, <laughs> system, <laughs> other than complete gene editing in terms of knockout and knock in. There are a couple of other things that um, that are happening. Um, we can change that single stranded RNA to anything we want, right? Anything at all. So we can actually use it to create antibiotics. That's another tool. And I'm always on the antibiotic kick because I was a microbiologist first. And if you had asked me two years ago, what are we going to have first, a viral pandemic or a um, antibiotic resistant bacteria, I would have said antibiotic resistant bacteria, but um, it's still on the horizon. It's still looming, right? So um, <laughs> you, can, you can use the CRISPR system to actually target bacteria, right? So we can use, th this system was originally found in bacteria, but we can manipulate it to actually go back and target itself and to then kill the bacteria because you chew up the bacterial genome. So you can design CRISPR to attack a bacteria, right? That'll give you an antibiotic. Um, you can use it for transcriptional activation. So this targets bacterial genome. If you want it for transcriptional activation, do you think we're going to make any cuts? No, that's a recruitment thing, right? Transcriptional activation. I want to recruit transcription factors. So you take the Cas9 protein, Cas9, and you mutate it. Mutate the catalytic domain. Move up domain so it can't it can't cut and then what you do is you attach um, factors that recruit all the necessary equipment for transcription so maybe it recruits a polymerase Right, or maybe it recruits another transcription factor, TF, transcription factor, right? So you use it as a recruitment tool. I need to increase expression at gene X. So this is what I do, right? But the other thing that you can do is, is similar but opposite. You could do transcriptional deactivation. So in this one, you do that same Cas9 mutation, yeah, mutate, right? But instead of attaching factors that recruit, what do you attach? Suppressors. You attach suppressors, transcriptional suppressors. Transcriptional repressors, right? So that's another interesting thing. Maybe you're getting too much expression of this one gene. Well, I can change the expression just by using CRISPR-Cas9. The other thing that you can do is you can do it to actually locate and visualize pieces of DNA. Like if I wanna know where this particular sequence is on the chromosome, I can actually attach it to an autofluorescent molecule. So you can do autofluorescence. So you, you do the same Cas9 mutation, and then you attach 
a fluorescent molecule like green fluorescent protein, GFP. Y'all heard of GFP, right? Maybe? Yes? No? It was found in jellyfish, and we use it a lot in, in, in all kinds of cell biology studies. But let's say you want to know how long are telomeres in a particular species. Well, if you put the telomeric sequence into Cas9 and you attach this autofluorescent unit, you can see how much of the DNA fluoresces at the end. You can actually go in and measure that. Isn't that cool? So there are so many different applications, and these are just a few. There are many others, but these are just a few. Isn't this so cool? Now, if y'all don't come away from class today pumped, I got nothing for you. <laughs> this is so, so amazing. You know, the, the way that we used to manipulate DNA was to take a virus. And you know, some viral, some viruses are designed so that they will actually incorporate their DNA into the host DNA, right? And then at some point later in down the road, right? Then the, then the viral genome will pop out and you can make more viral particles, right? Y'all have heard of that? Okay. So what we used to do is take one of those viral vectors and use it to insert a correct gene into the genome. But where did it go? We don't know. Is it expressing correctly? Uh, we don't know, right? How much better is it to actually change the endogenous gene and fix it than it is to put in a random copy of something using a modified virus? right? It's a hundred to a thousand times more effective. It's that much better. It's amazing. Questions about CRISPR. <laughs> Is it possible to change a stem cell to extend life? You could absolutely change stem cells. You could, but in terms of stem cells, you got to think you, you have to maintain a certain population of stem cells, right? For your life to continue. But you also have to have some of those cells differentiate into liver cells, blood cells, whatever it is. So if you trap those stem cells, let's say in that regenerative phase, how do you also have some differentiating into what you want them to become? So that gets a very tricky. That gets extremely tricky. What's, what's the thing that controls like the lifespan? Well, so in some of them, it's telomere length, right? So you, so you have the Hayflick limit, the number of times something can replicate because every time you replicate, you shorten the telomeres. But in stem cells and things like that, they have telomerase, which goes in and extends the telomeres for them so that they never reach that limit. But you also have to think about over time, you're gonna accumulate mutations in general. So yes, we wanna extend life, but at what cost, right. right? You introduce more mutations, but now we have a way to fix those mutations. So there's lots of really interesting so things. Over time, the uh, they yeah, time. every time your DNA replicates, they get cut. And that, causes, and that causes, yeah. And so eventually, because the telomeres are so repetitive, they bind with each other. And so the cell doesn't see the end of your chromosomes as a double-stranded break. But eventually when all those telomeres disappear, the ends of your chromosomes now look like double-stranded breaks and your cell goes crazy and dies. Yeah. Yeah, so totally, totally cool. Anybody else? Oh, it's awesome. So what I posted for you, because I think it is so insanely amazing uh, here, okay, is three different CRISPR, um, videos. One of them, this is a whiteboard lesson about CRISPR, and it actually talks about a portion of the targeting system that we didn't talk about in class, the PAM sequence. Your book covers it, but it's kind of a pretty high detail. But if you're interested, it's super interesting. And then I also posted the two Nobel lectures from the Nobel Prize winners in 2020. Um, awesome. You should watch them. Awesome. Okay, so for the rest of the class, I want to go to a earlier technology <laughs> and um, and I want to talk about how we create plasmids because I think this is something um, that kind of gets covered in the book, but is kind of hard to understand. And then the last thing that I want to talk about, let's see, and we might not get to these. So 
I'm going to give them to you as a study tool, right? At the end of every section, there are questions. There's one question that they have the answer to immediately following the question. Then there's another question. And they don't give you the answer to that. My recommendation is when you're studying, cover up the answer to the first question and try that question. That question usually will tell you, did you comprehend the stuff from that section or not? It's a really good way to kind of like sum it up, right? So those questions are all here. So the answer isn't right there. <laughs> and you're not tempted to look at it until after you answer it. So if you're using those as a study tool, do not just read the question and then read the answer. Read the question, get a sheet of paper out and attempt an answer. Then check your answer against what's there. You're going to be much more effective in your studying if you do that. And the other thing that you can use as a study tool are the end of chapter questions. I've said this before, right? That you can do the same thing where you look at those questions and then the answers are actually, guess what, in the back of the book. Okay. Questions on that? All right. So what I want to do is I want to talk about this cloning a peptide. I think I opened it here. No, here. Okay. So that I can view it full screen. I can't do it that way. All right. So a lot of times you're going to hear that in research, we're tasked with cloning a gene, right? What does that mean? That means that you're going to take a gene that's found in any organism. You're going to insert that DNA fragment into a plasmid. Then you can express the protein that that piece of DNA codes for. Then you can purify it. You can do all kinds of biochemical tests on this protein. That is something that lots and lots and lots and lots of labs do. So the question is, how do you do that? Well, the first thing that you do is you have your, let's say you have your human cell. Maybe it's a human gene I want to look at, right? I have a human cell. What I do is I PCR for my gene of interest, gene of interest. This is my PCR product, right? Because PCR was in this section, right? Was in this chapter. I have this PCR product. The protein, or this is really, this is really a shortened version. So we're only calling it a peptide because it's really, really small. The peptide goes from right here to right here, okay? But I have some flanking sequence, right? Upstream and downstream. What I want to be able to do is to take this gene and put it into this plasmid. What are some characteristics that you have to have in, in a plasmid that I'm gonna use for expression? Well, if I put it in, I want to have a way to figure out where that gene is going to go, right? So what I do is I cut my PCR product and I cut my plasmid vector with the same thing. What am I cutting DNA with? <coughs> Restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes that are endonucleases. So they cut DNA. These are examples of those restriction enzymes. So these are, we call them REs, restriction enzymes. And they're found at the multiple cloning site. That's what the MCS stands for, multiple cloning site. So theoretically, if I cut my PCR product and my plasmid with the same restriction enzymes, I should be able to glue my new piece into the circle and recircularize it, right? Because if I cut it once, it turns into a linear piece of DNA, but then I'm going to attach it to my PCR product, right? So now I have this, but at the multiple cloning site, I now have my insert. Does that make sense? Okay. So every plasmid must have a multiple cloning site. So plasmids. 
What do they have? They have a multiple cloning site. That's your insert. That's where it's going to insert. Now, there are a couple of other things that a plasmid must have. If I want this plasmid to replicate, it must have an origin of replication. They call them an ORI, O-R-I, origin of replication. So that's right here. So this plasmid will replicate inside of a bacteria. I also want to have at least one, sometimes two, antibiotic resistant genes. Antibiotic resistant genes. So maybe this is ampicillin, AMP R. So this, this makes my bacteria resistant to ampicillin. Maybe this one is tetracycline. So it's tet R. See the little R? The R indicates resistance. So this is the gene that gives the bacteria the ability to fight tetracycline or to fight ampicillin. Okay. And the last thing is XGAL. So this gene, I'm going to highlight it in blue, is here. Do this and here. What's inside the laxy gene? On this plasmid, what is inside the laxy gene? What's in between the blue? The multiple cloning site. So if it's just the multiple cloning site, it's small enough that the, the organism can make the whole laxy gene and it will express and it will work. But what happens if I put a big old PCR product in there? Laxy won't work anymore. So what, what Laxy gene does is it will metabolize a dye from blue to white. So if Laxy is all perfectly put together, right, it'll be blue. If Laxy is interrupted, it'll be white. So what we do is we clone into our plasmid, then we put that plasmid Yes, ma'am. So blue is uninterrupted, uninterrupted. Oh, ho, ho. what am I doing? P R U P T E interrupted. And then white is interrupted. Interrupted. A one T or two? I don't know. One T? Y'all know what I mean. <laughs> Okay, close enough. So what I wanna do is I wanna put my PCR product into this plasmid, right? Then I wanna plate it and I wanna see that it is, this new bacteria that's picked up this plasmid is resistant to ampicillin, is resistant to tetracycline and the laxy gene no longer works, right? Then I know that I have inserted my PCR product, and I can do whatever research I want to do on it, right? So this little piece of LAC-Z that's right here is the promoter. So now this promoter will promote transcription of my peptide, and it'll make my peptide, and I can express it. It's totally cool. This is a really cool system. Not as cool as CRISPR, but very cool. So the first thing that you have to do when you're doing this is to say, okay, I need to cut my PCR product and my multiple cloning site of my plasmid with the same thing in order to get it to fit in. So how do you know what restriction enzymes to use? Well, you have to know the restriction enzymes and you have to know their recognition sequences, right? So when you're looking at these recognition sequences, tell me, what does this mean? Because look at echo R1. Let's do one together. Look at echo R1. If I'm looking at the DNA, right, DNA is double stranded. This is echo R1. I get G A A T T C. What would my other strand be? C T T A A G, right? Now with me on that? Okay. How does echo R1 cut this piece of DNA? 
Look at this. So you have a cut between G and A. And because these are palindromes, where else do you have a cut? At the other G and A. So what you end up with after the restriction enzyme has cut is this sequence, G, P, T, A, A. That's one side and the other side is A, A, T, T. I need to move this. C, G, right? They're separate now. That makes sense? Now I can use those ends and insert them wherever I want them as long as I cut my plasmid with the same sequence. So what I want you to do is I want you to analyze this fragment, this PCR fragment. And if you write the complementary sequence underneath on your sheet of paper, then look for the palindrome. It's easier to find, it just is. So I want you to look and see which restriction enzymes cut this fragment. Then you have to look at which restriction enzymes cut your vector, your plasmid. Plasmid vector, it's the same thing. Two words mean the same thing, plasmid vector. And so I want you to decide which restriction enzymes we should use for this. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes. First thing is find the restriction enzymes that cut your PCR fragment. That's the first thing you wanna do. And y'all can help each other. Y'all can talk to each other. It's all good. You should find three sites. Let's see if I can zoom in while y'all do that. Because I know there's a way. That's better. Y'all find any? Yeah, which one? What's the first one you find? SAC1. Y'all see a SAC1 site? So what's SAC1? Come down right here. This is the SAC1 cleavage. So see if you find this sequence towards the beginning of our PCR fragment. Do you see it? GAG. So it goes right here, cleaves between the C and the T, and you get cleavage right there. So between the C and the T, right? Sac one between the T and the C. Oh no, the T and the C, not the C and the T. We'll do it right there. Y'all see that? Yeah? Yes. Okay, so look at SAC1, GAG, CTC. So go find GAG, CTC. Do you see that? So, so here, it's hard for me, it's GAG, CTC, right? So I match that with this site. Then I look, okay, where's my cleavage? My cleavage is between the T and the C. So I'm actually gonna cut it between the T and the C right there. My pen width is way too big for this. Well, you can, you can, because it makes more sense because that's actually how restriction enzymes work. So I think it makes more sense, but, but that's what you're looking for. There are two more. So this is the SAC one. You don't really need the whole sequence. You just need the double-stranded sequence at the cut sites. Anybody find another one? There's one in here. The SMA1. So if you go down and find what's the sequence for SMA1, 
So SMA1 is CCC. So if we look here, we have CCC right here. And where does it cut? Between the CCC and then GGG. So the site is right here. CCC, GGG, it cuts between the last C and the first G. Yeah? OK, you got another one? What's that? Echo? I don't see echo. BAM H BAM H1. That's what we call it. BAM H1. And it looks like an I, but it's it's the Roman numeral one. Okay. So what's the sequence? G G A T C C. Right? So you look here. BAM H1, G G A T C C. So go and find that. G G A T C C. So where does it cut? between the two G's. Okay, so now if I have these three sites, pick two, which two do I wanna use? BAM H1 and SAC1, why? Because they flank the sequence. If I use SMA1, it's gonna cut my peptide right in the middle. I don't want that. I wanna insert my whole thing in. Right? So then I use the same BAMH1 and SAC1, and that's what I use to insert it into my plasma. No. 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 <laughs> no. Test is Wednesday. Any other questions? BAMH1. You want a Rice Krispie for the road? Take a Rice Krispie on CRISPR day for the road. Y'all have a good rest of your day. Anybody on Zoom need anything? Not looking at the chat. Anybody still there? So the BAMH1 and SAC, yes, or to get it inserted not into the genome, into the plasmid or the cloning vector. Okay, you're welcome. Take, you can take more than one. Like, like, take a few. Yeah, that's good. It's good. Please don't, please don't let me go home with that. Yes. Yeah, good. So Tammy, you got that? I don't know if you can hear me. Can I scroll where the sequence is? Yes. This one? Okay. I did. It's CRISPR day. We're talking about CRISPR. Okay. Right. So it's Rice Krispie. All right. I saw it. Everybody didn't know when it coming out. I said something. So. That was me. That was me. Okay. Let me see. I think everybody on Zoom. I'm, I don't know what I do with my Zoom chat. There it is. Yes, they also having trouble with calculations in chapter two through with three energy. Did you try the videos that I posted on the extra problems on Gibbs free energy? Okay, if y'all have questions, I'm gonna answer them outside so that I can give up this room. Mm -hmm. So Tammy, were you able to check those? Which video is it on the list? So it is, did I just close it? I just did close it. Okay, so go to Moodle. Well, so Tammy, send me an email and I'll, I'll send it to you because somebody else needs the room. So send me an email and I'll send you the link. Okay, good. All right. And 